This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. One of the earliest known examples of a foreigner complaining about the British weather can be found in a book written 2,000 years ago by the Greek scholar Strabo. In Britain, writes Strabo, it's more rainy than snowy, and on days of clear sky, fog prevails so long at a t- for so long at a time that throughout the whole day the sun is to be seen for only three or four hours round about midday. That passage comes from the Geographica, one of the first and most important works of ancient geography. It describes almost the entire world known to Greek and Roman scholars at the time, from Britain to Egypt and India. It's one of the few lengthy works of the period to have survived in its entirety and reveals that Greek geographers were surprisingly sophisticated in their knowledge and methods. With me to discuss Strabo's Geogra- Geographica are Paul Cartledge, A.G. Leventis Professor of Greek Culture at the University of Cambridge, Maria Pretzler, Senior Lecturer in Ancient History at Swansea University, and Bennett Solway, Senior Lecturer in Ancient History at UCL. Paul Cartledge, Strabo was born in Pontus, in what we now call Turkey, around 64 BC. Could you give us somehow an idea what the Greek and Roman world was like at that time? Yes, he was uh, born at, uh, in retrospect, um, what the Germans call the Zeitwende. That's to say, uh, the time from what we call BC or BCE and AD and CE. He spanned that junction. He wouldn't have known that because that um, chronographic system wasn't introduced until the 6th century AD. But nevertheless, he lived at an extraordinarily exciting time, though he came from a relative backwater in, as you say, what's today Turkey, just south of the Black Sea. He was part of the biggest thing in the West. We're, of course, forgetting China for the moment, namely the Roman Empire. And the time that he was born was when the Roman Empire was achieving its largest extent. It had started off in Italy and then spread out Sicily, Sardinia, and so on. But in his own lifetime, and actually just about the time he was born, Rome expanded to include what is now um, Western Turkey, Central Western Turkey, Syria, the Middle East. And then shortly after his birth, within about 30 years, the Roman Empire included Egypt, and then it went even further, west and east. And uh, this was a time when the Romans were themselves very conscious that they were becoming the masters of what they called modestly the Orbis Terrarum, the orb of all the lands. So if you think global today, this was the ancient equivalent of globalization. What do we know about the background and life of Strabo himself? We actually know very little indeed, and what we do know, we know only from his own work. We guess that he was born round about 60. It might be 64, as you said. It could be 63, 62, which actually is just about the time that Augustus, the man who becomes called Augustus, the first Roman emperor, was born. And very interestingly, their lives actually overlap and in a way sort of track each other quite closely. Apart from that, we don't actually know his full name. Strabo means squinty in Greek, squint-eyed. It's not a very polite term. But we do actually it know... sounds good. You've spoiled it now. We <laughs> do know some Romans who had that as their cognomen, their last name. And so um, it's because the Greek and Roman worlds were coming together. It's often um, something people forget, but the eastern half of the Roman Empire was Greek-speaking. So I'm a professor of Greek culture. Well, my remit doesn't stop before the Romans. <laughs> the Romans were also themselves Greek. So Strabo was born in the 60s, and um, at some point in his life he went first of all to Rome, and later on he went to Alexandria. These are the two political and cultural capitals of the ancient world. He was extremely well placed, in other words, to have a sense of what the entire world was somewhat like. How far he travelled, we can perhaps come to this, is another issue. But he is part of the great Greek presence which be, uh, is in the Roman Empire from the very beginning and that, that near roundabout that we've got Galen in medicine we've got Ptolemy yeah, uh, in yeah. astronomy and the, 
they're, they're intruding, they're intruding, they're dominating a lot of uh, Roman culture. Well, famously, Horace, another contemporary, yeah. said that um, captive Greece took its fierce captive conqueror and introduced the arts. And, of course, he was talking primarily about literature but also about visual arts. But Strabo, Dionysius from Halicarnassus, other intellectuals went to Rome, but they did their research uh, very often in Alexandria because that had a, a larger, a deeper collection of Greek texts. Remember, they were Greeks, but they were writing not just for Greeks, but also for Romans. Maria Pretzler, the Geographica describes most of the world as, um, as Paula said, known to the Romans and Greeks. How much travelling did Strabo himself do? Probably not as much as he wants us to think. <laughs> uh, in the early books, this is in book two, where he tries well, we to establish... Say there are 17 books. Yeah. There are 17 books. So the first two books are introduction in a way, and he also tries to establish his credentials. Why is he the person to write this work? And at one point in book two, he actually says, I have travelled very widely, and generally, compared to other people who have written works like this, I've seen a wider span of the world. He claims to have been from Armenia to uh, Etruria, so Tuscany, really, and in the north from the Black Sea to the mountains of Ethiopia, as he says. And that essentially spans the world. Now, it's not actually true that he's travelled all that much. This is, in a way, a trope. If you write about geography, but also about history, you need to say that you've seen a lot for yourself. Uh, Polybius introduces this, a man who really has travelled a lot, I have to say. So Strabo did see a few places. We can usually tell from his work what he describes from autopsy and what he describes from hearsay, from other books and so on. So he knows pretty large parts of, of Asia Minor, of course, so Turkey nowadays. Uh, of course, the place he comes from, Pontus, which is close to the north coast, the Black Sea coast of Turkey, and then parts of Western Asia Minor, around Ephesus, places like that. Um, he clearly was in Italy. I mean, he knows Rome, and there are lots of references to that. There are also references to events in Rome, and uh, as Paul has already said, I mean, he probably stayed in Rome for quite some time. Now, he's clearly been to parts of Tuscany, probably also Campania. And he Has he been further west? No, not for the West. He sort of says, he hints that he's seen Sardinia, but how far that's true is hard to tell, but probably not for the West, actually. And, and then in the South, I mean, he clearly stayed a while in Alexandria and then also went up the Nile. How much uh, geographical scholarship existed at the time that he was writing? Quite a lot, particularly in Alexandria. There's a really big tradition. Now the interesting thing I think about Strabo is that his work isn't just universal in terms of geography going all the way from Britain to India but also in terms of how you write about geography. So there are different ways of doing it and different scholars have done different things with geography. So first is the real theory of geography where you basically try and work out how to draw a map of the world and this goes back to 6th century Asia Minor Hecataeus and so on, and then again was developed very much in Alexandria after Alexander. Um, Eratosthenes is perhaps the most important scholar there. So that's one thing. Then the next thing you need to do is you fill the map with places that are accurately placed. Remember, they didn't obviously know how to, how to determine longitude. Latitude works quite well. And that again starts with lists of places. That, those go back all the way to the Iliad where all the participating places are listed geographically. We get seafarers, lists of places around coasts and so on. And this culminates really in map making a bit later than Strabo. And then finally, cultural geography. where you ha Now you've got your map, you've got the place names in it, and now you're starting to describe what happens there? What is the culture there? What animals and plants might you find? What climate? Very important for Greeks, the myth. How do you define these places by what their past is and how that past relates to Greek myth? And all that comes together in Strabo in one big work. Ben Atolway, he seems to have spent, uh, as far as we know, and Paul pointed this out earlier on, uh, much of his, uh, a great deal of his life in Rome. Why did he go there and what influence did that have on his work? Well, he comes to Rome 
as part of a sort of general hoovering up of many Greek intellectuals I into the Roman orbit. Uh, Rome is now the financial, the power centre. So if you like, there's a brain drain in some ways from the Greek East to the West and to Rome as a centre. Uh, we don't know how long he spent in terms of continuous periods in Rome, but we know certainly, as Paul said, that he, he went there on a number of occasions over his life. Um, and what's interesting is that the Rome he saw will have changed a lot between his first time he went, when he was about 19, 20, um, in about 44 BC. So we're here in the, the period of the murder of Caesar. He certainly lives in interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> to when uh, his la the later events he talks about um, towards in the last decade of the, uh, the centuries BC, beginning of the centuries AD, uh, by which time Rome will have gone from really in architectural terms, um, somewhat of a backwater to uh, somebody coming from the Greek East, to sort of coming along, uh, acquiring some of the grand public buildings that we now as tourists associate with Rome he would have seen the birth of that, the early days of that. It's a bit like coming to London, perhaps, in the uh, 18th century and seeing George in London spread out over the West End, uh, coming here, you know, on visits, uh, it, with decades separating them sometimes. Um, but he comes, really, probably, to begin with, to seek uh, learning. He talks about uh, his teacher, grammatical teacher, Tyrannion, who had come to Rome involuntarily as uh, a political hostage, but then makes a living off the Roman aristocracy, because one of the things to be a rounded, educated Roman in the first century BC was to master Greek as a language and master Greek culture. So they needed these Greeks to give them that edge. Before the Geographica, uh, 17 volumes, as yes. has been mentioned, Strabo wrote an even longer book known as Historical Sketches, more than 40 volumes, which has been lost. Do we know anything about it? We know a little bit about his historical works. As you say, we know there's one called the Historical Sketches. Um, there's also possibly a separate work called After Polybius. And there's a disagreement in scholars as to whether there are two historical works or one historical work. But in either case... Polybius was a historian yes, uh, who um, uh, was died about 60 years before uh, Strabo was born, as yes. I remember. And Strabo is supposed to have written a continuation of Absolutely, his history, yeah. bringing it up to his present. Yes. And all that's lost, which is a bit of a shame. Yes, so he's taking history from where Polybius left it. Um, Polybius, like Strabo, being a Greek who'd come into close contact with the Romans himself as one of these initially involuntary visitors as a political hostage, mm -hmm. uh, but stays on in Roman circles and writes a history that ends if you like, at the first high point of Roman conquest uh, in 146-145 BC, the conquest of Carthage and of Corinth, that, that establishes Rome as the master of the Mediterranean, uh, at least the Western and Central Mediterranean. What the narrative given by Strabo did was to bring that down to its present day and probably ending very soon after the conquest of Egypt, which Paul referred to, at which point Rome has now conquered the entire Greek world, or nearly the entire Greek world, brought it under certainly political domination. Um, and so that, that brings you from Rome as the major player to really Rome as the sole power. Paul Cartledge, um, do have we any idea why he wrote the Geographica and who he wrote it for? You mean other than for his own pleasure, as it were? But, well, um, he does make clear that he's writing not just for um, very, very specialised um, geographical experts, people who are mathematically inclined. On the other hand, obviously... Why he's mathematically? Well, because of the drawing of maps, latitude, longitude, the angles of the, the sun, the seasons, there's not that. I mean, Maria will correct me, but there's not a huge amount of that Others had written, if you like, mathematical geography, whereas he writes more what we would call geographical history or sociological geography. It's a hybrid uh, genre, but you won't get a lot of terrifically technical stuff. You and I, or at least you probably could understand this, but I You're find it, poor, that yeah. sort of uh, scientific um, <laughs> mathematical geography very, very baffling. So he's writing for, obviously, if he thinks he's going to be read, people who can read. Well, that knocks out probably 80% of the Greek-Roman world, at least. 
He's, on the other hand, um, also hoping, I think, to, have, to make a difference, to, to have an effect. And so, as I said in my uh, original uh, remarks, the, the Roman world is expanding. What Strabo wants is to enable his readers to get a sense of the geography of this new unit, this new political unit. And in some sense, he's speaking about power in directly. In other words, he's wanting people to get a sense of what the terrains within which um, people are now having to operate are like, so that they operate better. Uh, he is aiming to be practical, not purely informative in the sense of entertaining. So if I was to sum it up, he's writing for intelli- what the sort of readers that I write for, intelligent general readers, as opposed to merely people such as himself in you know, high intellectuals. Maria Pratchett, you put your hand up, but while you're thinking of what to, what to interject, can I also feed a question <laughs> in? Um, can you give us an idea? Well, you say what you want, then I'll ask you another question. I mean, just the sort of thing that Strabo actually, I mean, this is absolutely right, but he says quite explicitly that geography is specifically important for generals and politicians. So he is actually also thinking of, of what the Romans are probably still doing. I mean, he's seen the Romans still conquering, I mean, we now think of Egypt somehow as a stop. I mean, there is still expansion, but that I think you couldn't see from his point of view. So the idea is also, let's know more about geography in order to know how to conquer, what to conquer, and what we are going to find there. And that goes back to Bolivia. Sorry, just to, I mean, Mm -hmm. there's a direct connection there. Maria, can you give us some idea of the structure of these 17 books? Yes, I mean, it is, of course, quite difficult if you imagine you're living in a world where maps probably exist, but probably rather as very scientific method rather than something that everyone knows about. And they are not familiar with the satellite's eye view that we are. Um, when they think Mediterranean, I'm not sure whether they have that image in their head that we probably do with Italy sticking in, into it from the north and so on. So what they did, and there's a long tradition of this, is that the Mediterranean is described as what's called a periplus. It means sailing around, and you usually start, and this goes probably back to the 6th century at least, you start in Spain, go all around the north coast of the Mediterranean, all the way to Syria, and then come back via the African coast, and you describe what's along it. Now what he's doing is he sort of subjects, subjects the whole world to this tour around the Mediterranean. So in a way, even India is part of that tour. So what he's doing, he starts in Spain, then adds in uh, Gaul, goes up to Britain, comes back, then Italy, uh, up to Germany, all the way around the Danube to the Black Sea, Uh, then Greece and the Balkans, of course, Asia Minor, and then there are two big detours, northern Asia Minor, all the way past the Caspian Sea, and all the way to what he calls Bactria. We probably think of Afghanistan, perhaps is the closest, Tajikistan, those sort of areas, Central Asia. And he comes back, does the western coast of Asia Minor. Troy is a place that interests him for far too long, I think. (laughs) And all the large (laughs) cities of uh, western Asia Minor, Pergamon, Ephesus, and so on. And then he goes to Cyprus, Syria, and then there is another detour. And then he goes all the way to India and does Persia, comes back... And then we've got, we are by now already in book 15 of 17. (laughs) So then very quickly he does Syria. Then there's a very good discussion of Egypt, which he knows fairly well. And then the last book is essentially Libya. So that's the whole uh, coast of Africa. And then he comes back to Gibraltar. Is he, does he mention at any stage, I, I, I know that others did, that it's very difficult to, to represent the globe, which they, they saw the earth as a globe then, on a flat surface? Yes, this is, this is certainly an issue. I mean, I think this is something that, I mean, the mathematical types that <laughs> Paul has mentioned try to solve. And um, we certainly have earlier calculations of this. I think where we really see this come uh, into its own is, is Ptolemy's map, which is, of course, not a map, but an instruction as to how to draw the map. And there we can see it very well. But they were certainly discussing the ideas of parallels, but also how many degrees of the globe you actually see. In the end, I mean, they were aware. They are basically seeing a quarter of it. Mm. They're seeing 180 degrees of the northern hemisphere. And they knew this, and this was quite clear. There were big discussions what happens in the bits that we don't see. Mm. And they even roughly had the right size for the globe, because Eratosthenes calculated 
the circumference of the Earth and got it almost right. I mean, don't look at these mathematics too well because there are all sorts of errors in it, but they happen to work out. And it's extremely accurate compared to what we know nowadays. So they have a notion of that. And then once you've got the bigger map, so what... Um, what Ptolemy comes up with is essentially a kind of, well, it's not quite a rectangle because it's, it's, it's obviously narrower at the top, but it is very difficult. I mean, map projection, I mean, this is something that still preoccupied them in the early modern period, and Mercator sort of sorted it out, but asked various people, not everyone is satisfied even with how we project maps yes. now. Yeah. Can I talk, can I turn to Bennett Solway? Before, uh, before uh, we talk more about the world, can we go back to those first two books of his where he, he, he discusses the discipline of geography and can you tell us what he said there and how it defines what ancient scholars understood about how to look at the world? Yes. Well, for him, geography is certainly a part of the general philosophy, philosophia, uh, which in our modern terms includes science as, as well as sort of theoretical um, ethical discussion. Um, and uh, he goes on after describing geography's proper place within philosophy to um, describe previous geographers. Uh, and here he includes, to our minds perhaps rather, rather surprisingly, Homer, though uh, Paul and Maria have already alluded to this. Um, really here, in a sense, he is being retrieving Homer for the contemporary Greek world after there's been somewhat of a backlash after Eratosthenes against Homer as being too poetic and not rigorous. So Homer's about eight ish, 800 <laughs> years before yes. him, and, but the work would be well known. And he spends a great deal of time with Homer. Can yes. you just develop that? Why is he so keen to draw information from Homer? I think because Homer is, in a sense, almost becoming a, uh, a foundation text for... The Iliad and the Odyssey. Yes, yeah. sorry, the... the the, 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 the po- yes, exactly. The, yeah. the, the two great epic poems ascribed to Homer have become foundation texts for uh, Greek education and Greek culture across the entire Greek world, not just Old Greece and Asia Minor. And this gives a common identity, a common platform, and giving them an identity within this n- new larger world, the Roman world that they're now in, but something which they can look back to as being before preceding uh, the Roman world, it, it, it reconfirms the superiority of Greek culture right back into what would have been prehistory in Roman terms, as far as he's concerned. And what, can you just give us some instances of what he takes, what specifically he takes from, uh, from, from Homer? Well, one of the things that uh, he does is to demonstrate that Homer knew, even when he d- he's not explicit, about the, the far reaches of the Oikoumene, This is the inhabited world that Maria's talked about, the quarter of the the globe. So even though Homer doesn't talk about or allude to the globe as being a sphere, as is now accepted by all the scientific geographers, Eratosthenes particularly, he says that that doesn't matter, that doesn't undermine Homer, because he did manage to demonstrate that that he knew the limits of the Oikoumene. So we've got the Indians to the Far East and Spain to the far west, and Ethiopia to the south, and the Scythians to the north. So, in other words, Homer knew the world that I will now describe in the geography. He's already there. So he retrieves Homer's reputation in terms of his no- breadth of knowledge. Can I just pitch in saying that uh, in the 20s, when one of the times that he would have been in Rome probably, Virgil is writing his Aeneid for Augustus, and uh, therefore absolutely at the heart of the imperial project. And of course, Homer in the Iliad mentions Aeneas. And of course, (laughs) Virgil and the Roman aristocracy made a great deal about Aeneas as being their founder. So it's a very good example of how Greeks and Romans are borrowing from each other but remaking their world and Strabo comes from a relatively provincial background but by going to Rome he's absolutely at the centre of the universe the intellectual as well as the physical universe 
Ben has told us quite a bit about Homer. Mm. Uh, can you uh, fill us in on mm. any other major sources? Yeah. Well, he refers to, I think um, I can be corrected, but something like 200 different individuals are named by Strabo as people he has presumably read or heard of. And sometimes it's not clear whether what he writes is actually a transcription of one or other of these, as opposed to his own making it up as he goes along. But there were about half a dozen major sources from among those 200. We've mentioned Homer. I think he has something like 700 references to Homer. The next big guy is, of course, Eratosthenes, one of my favourite ancient Greeks, because uh, he was nicknamed Beta. Why? Because though he covered the waterfront, he was not Alpha, i.e. the absolute top dog in any one of the many disciplines that he practiced. He was librarian of the great library at Alexandria. He wrote a work called Geography, and in fact he probably coined the very word, geographia, which means writing or description of the earth, the world. And um, he was therefore the second major source. After Eratosthenes, who functioned in the 3rd century BC, we have Polybius, we've mentioned him, a Greek, who travelled a lot, and he wrote about the way in which the Romans conquered the Greek world in the 2nd century, late 3rd, uh, middle 2nd century BC. After that, it gets a little more complex, but at any rate, one of the major sources of um, of uh, our man, Strabo, was Poseidonius, writing in the 1st century BC, and he came from Apamea in Syria. He's a Greek, but he came from Greek Syria. And the interest for Strabo, I think, was twofold, partly intellectual, but partly also um, spiritual, because Poseidonius was a Stoic. And um, we think that Strabo, too, was a Stoic. Can I go to, back to uh, Maria Pratchard again? Which sections of the Geographica are the most vivid? Can you give us a couple of examples, please? I think most vivid and accurate. Let's <laughs> put the two together. Um, the fun right, yeah, <laughs> I think the most vivid ones are the, the sections, I mean, usually, I think, generally acknowledged, w where we have a notion that he's been there. I mean, for example, he gives us the best description of ancient Alexandria mm. we've got left. I mean, there were probably other ones, but they are all gone. And mm -hmm. we've got his description, which is very vivid and tells us a lot about the city in his own time. Um, but generally, it's, it's often quite interesting. You get a glimpse of something that he could have done, but usually doesn't. I, mean, I work mostly on mainland Greece, and he's not very interested in Greece at all. Very interesting, hardly anything about Athens, almost Did he dismissive. Go to Athens? No, probably not. I mean, he wasn't even there. But he stopped buying Corinth at some point, mm -hmm. probably just on the way of, to, from Asia Minor, landing in one of the harbours of Corinth, and then the ship gets dragged across, or you take another ship on the eastern side to go on to Italy. And he actually took the time to climb the Aqua Corinthos, the Acropolis of Corinth. And it's an amazing description where he really brings together to geography. You will get the feeling there's a geographer on an, um, a very good viewpoint because from there you can understand the geography of Greece because you've got the isthmus of Corinth in front of you, the Pel Peloponnese on one side, mainland Greece with all its mountains, Panassos and so on, in front of you. And he describes it all and really shows his geographical understanding. And he, so he gets very fascinating whenever he's actually seen a place, but unfortunately hasn't seen all that many. Can we, Bennett, mm -hmm. away, um, can you say a little about Britain as we happen to be here uh, <laughs> at this time and his description of Britain? And before you start, uh, did he owe much to Caesar? To, to he to certainly, Calico? yes. Um, he certainly knew of that work and seems to have exploited it for mainland continental Gaul. And also it covers, of course, his expeditions into Britain. And he describes those in his sort of historical section as part of his description of Britain. So, yes, he's certainly exploiting that knowledge that he'll have got in Rome of Britain. It's not autopsy. <laughs> it's at second hand. And that, that really goes for everything he says about anything further west than the Italian peninsula. Uh, and the description of Britain is actually a very good sort of case study of his regional descriptions in microcosm. What interested you? Can you just pick out two or three things for well, us to see if we've changed much? <laughs> <laughs> You've already mentioned the weather, yeah. which he does which he yeah, does. That's list. really a sort of rather trivial review. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Uh, well, he starts off um, with each of his regional descriptions by giving some idea of the shape, because as Maria said, uh, we can't imagine that everyone had in their mind's eye the satellite view of the Mediterranean or the world beyond at all. So he starts off by saying that Britain is basically a triangle. 
which is for Great Britain, the island, that's a reasonable sort of generalisation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he did that, did that also for Spain, for instance, looks a bit like an ox hide. So this is the sort of established practice. And then he gives measurements, basic dimensions. What does he say happens in this place that was then? Uh, well, the inhabitants are in their habits rather like the continental Celts, but they're a bit more primitive and less civilised. And fundamentally that comes down to whether they live in settled communities or not. And his picture of Britain, which does not tie up with our archaeological picture of Britain, it has to be said, his picture of Britain is largely a a wooded, hilly landscape in which there are sort of nomadic pastoralists who live a sort of slash-and-burn culture, moving from clearing to clearing where they live in, as he says, round huts. Now, the round huts may be true, but we do know of proto-urban centres in uh, first century BC Britain. So his picture is not accurate and up-to-date. It's very vivid. Uh, and in- entertaining to read, but uh, n- certainly not from contemporary autopsy. And he says they're quite good at exporting stuff, but yes. not, mm. you mustn't take them over because <coughs> they're never gonna, like, are ever going to pay enough taxes. I don't think we'll get into that. That's sort of BC today. We're not going to do that. <laughs> OK. Um, Paul, um, the Greek explorer Pythias? Pythias? Yeah, Pythias. 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 Can you tell us about him and S- Strabo's attitude to his work? He's another hero of mine, like uh, Eratosthenes. He is the Christopher Columbus Mm -hmm. of the ancient Greek world because he discovered what might have been called by him pretaniki, as opposed to vretaniki, with understood land, but the land of the Bretons. And um, he travelled in the last quarter, probably, of the 4th century BC, came from what's today Marseille, Massalia, which was founded by Greeks from originally what's now Turkey, in about 600 BC. So instead of going east, he went west out of the pillars of Hercules, as they were called, turned right, went up Britain. As north, as we say. And, yes, <laughs> up, went north uh, through the Bay of Biscay, up till he hit the uh, south-east uh, corner of Britain, along south of uh, England, then up between England and uh, Ireland, Wales, of course, Ireland, up to... And then he mentions a place called Thule, and this comes out in Latin as Thule, in Latin, Ultima Thule, the mm-hmm. furthest Thule. Now, what was Thule? Was it Iceland, or was it merely one of the Shetlands. At any rate, all very circumstantial. He describes phenomena meteorological that are very specific to that uh, area accurately. However, however, where does Strabo hear about this? He hears about it in Eratosthenes. And Eratosthenes didn't believe that Pythias had done this, and Strabo didn't believe that uh, and Pythias had done this. And therefore, actually, it was even the case when Julius Caesar, as Bennett mentioned, invaded or at least landed in Britain twice, 55, 54 BC, people didn't believe that there really was such a place because there was an ocean surrounding the inhabited world and there was presumably nothing inhabited beyond the inhabited world. Therefore, Britain couldn't exist by logic. But anyway, he proved it existed, but already Pythias had proved it. And so it's one of the disappointing features to me of Strabo that he was so um, poor in realising that Pythias really had discovered Britain. in the end, two and a half millennia later, wherever it was, over two millennia, Pythias is getting his due. Yes, and from you, Paul, he's had and a whole Cambridge, book. so we're all right. He's, he's had resting a whole book written about in him. Whichever he... niche of Parnassus he finds himself, <laughs> he's, he's tickled pink this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maria Pretza, can you tell us what the, the limits of the world of Strabo? Let's just cut to the chest. What did you say, for example, about India? Yes, I think this is actually important to mention in the context of what we've just heard because we have to understand why Strabo is so willing to be sceptical about people who write about the edges of the earth. Now, India is our best example because that's always been... I mean, this goes back a long way, certainly the early 5th century. India is the place of the fabulous. And generally, the further you go... Oh, 5th century BC. BC. Yeah. Um, now... Generally, the further you go towards the edges of the world on all sides, the more fabulous things get. You get monsters, you get people who aren't quite human, so people with dog heads and various other things. Um, and feet they can use as umbrellas. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's handy, placed, that, yes, that's placed <laughs> in India. And all this starts, I mean, it starts with what the Greeks actually heard about India. So the first uh, books about India came back from people who were actually employed by the Persians. 
And in the early 5th century, there was a there was Silax who was asked to go down the Indus River and then find the, found out the way back to Arabia. Uh, by the, uh, on the sea, there was a there was a physician at the court of the Persian king Ctesias. They wrote the first information. Then, of course, a lot more comes back after Alexander because mm -hmm. people had actually seen the place. Greeks who could write about it. But the interesting thing is that by the time Alexander's channels came back and wrote about India, these fabulous stories had been so established, mm -hmm. probably written for entertainment rather than as a real uh, uh, geographical account, that they kept creeping back. So people who'd really been there, Nearchos, the, uh, the naval commander of Alexander, would sail down the Indus but nevertheless, there are strange peoples and old m animals and so on, gold digging ants, and all sorts of other things, simply because Greeks almost expected to find things like this there. So the problem now that happens is that Strabo is faced with a whole bulk of literature. Some of it is true and very exotic, because India is quite different from the Mediterranean, and some of it is not true, and he constantly has to make the call, and he doesn't always make the call accurately, and it's the same with Pythias on the other side of the <laughs> earth, I think. Bennett de Bertolle, um, so he's a Greek-speaking scholar in Rome. He seems to, Rome and Alexandria, because of the great libraries and because of the patronage, seem to yes. be in his home, which, as Paul pointed out, the 200 sources to start with. Um, so, but he had, did he have a, in any way a political perspective on the world? Was he trying to please Augustus, the first emperor? I will, I will show you your empire in words, and I might get promoted. Well, I would say that he's he probably occupies a middle ground between those Greeks working in Augustan Rome, who we know are really quite craven towards um, Roman political power, um, such as um, Diodorus, or, mm. but. Uh, and on the other hand, those who go too far in their free speaking, such as uh, Timagenes of Alexandria, who falls out and is banned from the palace of Augustus for saying bad things about the new patrons. Uh, with Strabo, we have someone who is describing the size of the new Roman world and clearly sees the Greek world as part of this world, but still the Romans are not us, they are them. There is an us and them, and the us are not the Romans, they are the wider Greek world and not the Romans. The, the, that brings the question of audience which Maria talked about. The, he wants to include generals and statesmen. The political man is, is some, uh, a term he uses. Now obviously in a sense in our minds as Maria said we can rather exaggerate the extent to which we imagine that this is the end of history sort of Francis Fukuyama type that uh, Rome is the destiny and there'll be no other option because the world in which Strabo lives is not yet always directly politically part of a Roman province, so that his own hometown, Amasea, Amasia, in Pontus, during his lifetime, starts off as part of the kingdom of Pontus. Now that is broken up by Pompey, partly becoming a province, but other parts becoming independent satellite states, which are under Roman control, but are still quasi-independent. And I think the Greek-speaking elites of that sort of uh, place like his own hometown are part of the audience he's aiming at. The uh, Paul Paul Cartage, uh, several classical texts have appeared. Let's take Galen, for instance, Greek text sailed into the Renaissance. They, they went through the mm. great great mm -hmm. Arab culture for, 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 to be added to as well as just translated. Mm. Just I mean, as well as translated. Yeah. Just. Was there any evidence that that happened with Strabo? Strabo, the post uh, history of Strabo, his text is extremely strange. Um, the great next scientific work in the Roman world um, after the death of Augustus was by the elder Pliny, man who died in the eruption of Vesuvius. He, was, he wanted to get very close to Vesuvius and he overwhelmed by the ashes. He doesn't mention Strabo. Plutarch, early 2nd century AD biographer, would have found it very useful in his biography of Julius Caesar, or whatever, to refer to Strabo. He doesn't. Ptolemy, whom Maria mentioned, this is Claudius Ptolemy, based in Alexandria, later 2nd century AD, geographer, scientific as well as human geographer, doesn't mention Strabo. The first mention of Strabo, the first clear understanding that Strabo was in existence as a text, 
doesn't come before the early 3rd century AD. I mean, really strange. Then, um, we go forward another three, four centuries, he first gets a real outing in a work of the 6th century CE AD by Stephanus, who is based in one of the other great capitals of the old ancient world, namely Byzantium, which is Constantinople by this time. And then, well, one leaps forward again. Uh, he's mentioned in the 15th century by George Gemistos Plethon, probably through a, an Italian traveller called Syriac of Ancona. Now, in that same century, Pope Nicholas V commissions a translation of Strabo. So we're in the High Renaissance, and it's that translation which allegedly Columbus read and then thought he could get to India, setting out westwards from Italy rather than east and south. If I may just go on to say... By the time we're in the 16th century, we have um, the first proper edition by Isaac Casabon, and therefore after that he's in print, he's a, he's a text that's commented, and he's bound to survive to the uh, future unless there's a nuclear holocaust. Maria Bradshaw, how do you account for this, uh, for this history of his history that Paul just outlined? It's difficult to tell because we've got plenty of authors from the Roman period for whom we don't have any quotations later on. I think one issue is that it became more and more fashion after Strabo, particularly in the 2nd century AD, it becomes more and more fashion to only refer back to classical authors, so 5th, 4th century BC, and authors of the earlier, like Homer. And so, in a way, it wasn't always necessary to cite these people. So it's quite difficult to, to see, and there are plenty of very good authors who don't receive any quotations at all. So yeah. the, the story that Paul is telling is not unique at all, and sometimes very surprising. So, so it is difficult to tell, but I think fashion is an issue. Also, he doesn't quite write the kind of Greek that they really liked reading in the second century AD, which is classical Athenian Greek. And so that's another issue. Uh, many authors from the Hellenistic period and the early Roman period, so 1st century BC, AD, were simply not preserved because of this. Uh, finally, uh, Menes Holloway, mm -hmm. apart from setting Columbus off on his travel <laughs> in the wrong direction, as Paul has pointed out, <laughs> <laughs> what, can you point out briskly one or two influences you might have had after the 16th century? What contemporary... Quantum influence, yeah. Well, I suppose <laughs> for you, 16th century today is contemporary, yes. We're running out of time. Though. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, th his influence in the ancient world um, is, in fact, something, he pick on something that Maria says, may be seen in Josephus, writing in the 1st century AD, who does quote him a number of times, and I think he picks up the message to the Greek world that you... It ma Rome is big, it's too big to defeat. And I've got to go. We've got to go. Of Office, sorry. Maria, really sorry. Maria Pretzel, thank you. Paul Cartledge, Bennett Solway. Next week we're talking about Doomsday. Thanks for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Did you enjoy that? Maria? Yes, I really did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, introduced, you, you introduced one of my great heroes, oh. Syria Kofankona. Oh, he is the I'm most amazing person, I have to say. Who's that? Syria Kofankona. He was a man who knew the Pope at the time, he knew the last Byzantine Emperor yes. and probably also the Ottomans. Yeah. He was a trader. He writes the first description of Greece before well, the last and first description before it shuts down because it's taken over by the Ottomans. Yeah. He makes amazing drawings yes. of yeah. all the sorts of monuments, on, and without him, yeah. there are lots of ancient inscriptions we, we wouldn't know have. because yeah. he copied the, uh, Latin ones yeah. and Greek ones, taught himself Greek. He so is a great, good yeah. pitch for another in our time. I yeah. think well, no, this serious. seriously yes. that will be a program that you really want to make. Very, very interesting. Yeah, subject, I mean, yeah. Syria yeah. Different, because he brings together the Byzantines, the Ottomans, right. and the Western world, yeah. the Pope's attempts of trying to keep that conquest at bay. Yeah. And he was probably involved in that politically. He's culturally amazing. Yes, you want the, you want to make a program up. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about the books, though. You were talking about books. I think maybe we should have mentioned these. These are rolls of papyrus, aren't they? Oh, yes. About. Yes, yes. 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 physically. We didn't talk about physical form, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Have we, have we, have we, have we ever seen? Have, have we got, are, there, are there extant editions of these 17 volumes in papyrus? I'm afraid yeah. not. Uh, we only have codex. Yeah. Isn't we, there a palimpsest? There is, but it's a codex palimpsest. Yes, yes. Right, right, right. Not a, um, I mean, not a roll. Style, yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. not a volume. And essentially the text was on it and washed off and something else written over it. So, so yeah, yeah, we're very lucky on this one. 
I guess. But no, I mean, there's very little in papyrus scrolls. I mean, I, I've always found that if I want to know how a, how a scroll is being read, you have to go to a synagogue because there they, yeah, they can actually so tell you how hard yeah. it is to <laughs> find passages in it and how big these scrolls are. 17 yeah. books are essentially a bookshelf full of books. Yes. You have to think that some of these some of these large works are called library, like Diodorus's yes, library, library of history. history yes. It is a library. It would fill this wall yeah. in shelves like with the skulls yeah. working out. I'm not going to measure it out. <laughs> what do you think, Paul? How, how broad is the wall? <laughs> it's about 12 10 feet. feet. 10 to 12 feet. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> three, four, four, <laughs> three and meters. You imagine it's some sort just, of pigeon holes. It's bigger than your average prison cell, isn't yeah. it? Yes. Yeah. Really. You, you, you imagine pigeon holes and the, yeah. and the scrolls stuck into them. End That's how. And yeah. end on with yeah. labels, labels hanging down. down yeah. I think the longest surviving is 22 feet. It's yeah. uh, Plato's Timaeus. Hmm. If you can imagine, 22 feet. Hmm. And you scroll yourself along it. Yes. So, yes. The, the, so most people in films, you always see people have one bit of the scroll holding with the up, up and then down. But, but actually, no, actually, you hold them sideways exactly, exactly. and twiddle. And twiddle. Yeah. And you scroll over, so yeah. it's written in columns, yeah. and you have one column open at a given time, and then scroll yourself along. But actually, memory is what yeah. you know. Yes, you, it's you a bit like the Chi uh, a lot of Chinese painting, early painting, isn't it? Yes, they do the long scroll. They show the yeah. journey uh, along a scroll like that. Yes, roll it out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that's the only way to do it if you've got to roll up the scroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's very much how it works. Yeah. But did we miss out anything? Damaging, Bennett. Oh uh, no! I mean, the the point I was trying to finish on and didn't manage to uh, Sorry, get my across. Sorry, <laughs> I, I, I asked, too, <laughs> you, no, you I asked too big a question well, too late. There you, you, you go. You, you threw me a real googly on the post sixteenth century history of the of the text. Well, Paul had taken this from the from zero to the fifteenth well, um, century. You mean who is he influenced? Minutes. Has anyone said straight? <laughs> this is the right and I'm really. No. No. Okay, I don't so think so. I mean, I think one thing you could say, I mean, post 16th century, but what you get in early geography, when you read any kind of text, 17th century actually, about yeah. Africa, about Asia, and so yeah. on, very often what they do is they describe the coasts according to up to date information because they've got that, yeah. and then they fill in the center with straight yes. And that still happens. I mean, a lot of it in the 17th century, if you read the accounts, yeah. even of parts of the Mediterranean, they know the coasts very well, and the place names are in Italian. Yeah. And then you go inland and describe it, even on maps. Yeah. The inland place names are ancient Greek and come from Strabo and Pausanias. And various other it's people. used for infill, in a sense, yeah. where the information yes, is not... Tom, because yes, the, Ottoman, no. the Ottomans are there and you can't... We might be getting a cup of tea now, so thanks very much again. Mm. I feel we must just let Bennett finish his point, because he didn't, he didn't, he didn't was able to make it then either, I don't think. Ah, oh, right. Ben, Sorry. Well, point. my point was... The opportunity knock. Ah, yes. <laughs> Josephus, who we know is one of the few people who does quote him in extenso, mention him name, uh, mentions him by name and actually quotes him in extenso. Here, the speech that's given to Agrippa before the Jewish revolt, which is a warning about the size of the Roman Empire, uh, which is, you might defeat the Romans here, but they're all essentially... If you read Strabo, you'd know how big the Roman Empire is. There are always going to be more Romans to replace the ones is that you this defeat. Is the Hellenized Jewish local yes, ruler? Yes, the local ruler. He's the king Mate of the Mate of Claudius. Absolutely. Okay. Right. So, I mean, that's quite interesting. I mean, yeah, is he... Yeah. Big? I always thought he was actually quoting from the history, but it is actually yes, the, well, the geography. That, that, but it's because not because I knew there are references to no, the history it, in places. In, in the speech, there isn't a direct quotation at all. Right. But it's the evocation of the, of the inhabited size, world. But, uh, yeah, it's right. as if okay, okay, Agrippa yeah. has, has read his stray yeah, but yeah, we have oh, yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah, very much. Uh, coffee, coffee, coffee. Yes, likewise, thank you. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.